Here's Jeremy and You can tell it's summer. You don't have anything better to do. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I uh, want to welcome you to our event this morning on the uh, U.S.-China trade war. Uh, what's happening with it? Uh, we're going to give you the answer of exactly oh, what's going to happen over the next three months. So uh, to the hearing. Be, be, be forewarned. Uh, I'm uh, Rob Atkinson. I lead Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, ITIF has been focused on this issue for a long time, uh, starting in 2012 with our report, uh, Enough is Enough, Confronting Chinese Innovation Mercantilism, and we've continued to write on it since. Um, we have a great panel this morning. We're going to do this uh, really as a discussion this morning, not with formal uh, remarks or anything. Uh, I'm going to introduce everybody and then make a couple of opening remarks myself, and then we're just going to jump right in. Uh, Mike Pillsbury said he's coming. I will introduce Mike when, when and if he gets here. Uh, we start with Jeremy Waterman. Jeremy is the president of the China Center and vice president for Greater China at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Jeremy's been working on China at the Chamber for many, many years uh, and is a deep expert on thinking about what's <laughs> happening there. Prior to joining the Chamber, he worked at the U.S. China Business Council, was also at uh, uh, USTR uh, in the Office of Congressional Affairs in Africa. Uh, Claire Reed is uh, Senior Counsel at Arnold and Porter K. Scholler. Uh, Claire has had over three decades in dealing with international trade uh, strategy, negotiations, and litigation. She had spent eight years uh, in the Obama administration, uh, principally, uh, at USTR, where she was served as Assistant <laughs> U.S. Trade Representative for China Affairs and Chief Counsel for China That's Trade Enforcement. Nice Claire and I had the pleasure of being in a, a number of uh, SNED dialogues uh, in China and uh, seeing firsthand, although you saw it much more firsthand than I did, uh, exactly how those work and what the Chinese, uh, how they negotiate. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, Derek Scissors. Uh, Derek is a resident scholar at AEI, American Enterprise Institute, uh, where he focuses uh, principally on China, uh, Chinese and Indian economies. Hey, Mike. Uh, and also is the uh, author of the uh, global, uh, China Global Investment Tracker and Chinese Investment in U.S. Data Set. Uh, prior to that, he was an Asia, a senior fellow in Asia Studies at the Heritage Foundation. And uh, just joined by Mike Pillsbury. Uh, Mike is a senior fellow and director of China strategy at the Hudson Institute. Uh, he has a long, long background, longer than anybody here on the panel really, uh, engaged in China, thinking about China. Uh, he, during the Reagan administration, he was assistant under secretary of defense for policy and planning. Uh, he also um, served on the staff of four U.S. Senate committees and uh, is also the author of a book I highly commend you to read, uh, The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy Re to Replace America as a Global Superpower. Uh, very compelling book. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, actually, uh, do you read Chinese? Yeah, reads Chinese and so read a lot of Chinese documents, knows a lot of Chinese officials and really uh, went very deep in that book. And I'm so, a friend of ITIF. Thank you. We're a friend of you. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, the... Um, I think we all know the Trump administration uh, took another step in escalation of this uh, a couple of days ago, announcing tariffs, 10% uh, tariffs on $200 billion worth of additional products in addition to the $50 billion 
And uh, as expected, uh, the Chinese foreign affairs, foreign ministry official said, quote, we will take firm and forceful measures. So uh, we don't really know what that means and where it's going. I recently, in March, I wrote a little sort of tongue-in-cheek piece for National Review called Decoding China's Responses to Trump Trade mm -hmm. Sanctions, worth me quoting a couple of those. Uh, I, I would read a statement and then I would translate uh, what it means in English. So um, Premier Li Kuang uh, said, uh, quote, no one will emerge a winner from a trade war. Uh, what that means in English is we have been engaging in a cold war, tra cold trade war with America for more than 15 years and we are winning. If you respond, then we might not stop winning and we don't want that. <laughs> Um, Premier Li uh, said statement, what we hope for is to act rationally instead of being led by emotions. Uh, the translation is, is essentially is, wait, please don't take action against our unfair actions. Uh, and then, uh, perhaps most relevant today, uh, uh, Minister, uh, Commerce Minister Zhuang Shan said, quote, China will resolutely defend its interests. The translation <coughs> is, China will resolutely defend its interests. So with that, let me, uh, let me get started. And as I said, we're going to do this really uh, as a discussion. So um, everybody, just feel free to jump in. Give me the high sign if you want to jump in and you're not. Um, so I think the single most important question uh, is, um, we, we, we clearly appear to be in a, in, in a, in a trade war. The, the, the Chinese will respond. Uh, not clear exactly how they're going to respond on the next round. Uh, they have limited uh, bullets in the, uh, in the tariff gun, if you will, because they don't export that much to us. Um, uh, they don't import that much from us, I should say. And so they could sort of put tariffs on everything, uh, but even then it appears Trump would go and put tariffs on everything back. So we're about, uh, what, 35 percent now of tariff Chinese imports are being tariffed. We could go to 100 percent. So I guess the question is, where do you see this going? Um, the Chinese obviously have a whole suite of weapons besides tariffs. Uh, they can punish our firms in a many, many different ways. Uh, both firms in China and firms that are importing. I was reading some article about how they it had a, quote, inspection for a whole shipment of U.S. cherries and made them sit at the port for seven days, and then they all spoiled. So they, can do, they can do that. So let me just start off. Maybe, maybe Jeremy, where, where do you see this ending? Or Claire, whoever, I don't care. Where, where do you see this going? I mean, are we, uh, there's, there's a bunch of different ways this could be resolved. One is it just never gets resolved. We just end up with permanent tariffs. Uh, another way is somebody can blink. Uh, another way is, um, is, is we, we, we sort of get some minor resolution, sort of like the Korea deal, you know, not very substantive, but substantive enough to give the president some cover. Um, how do people see it happening, playing out? Anybody want to jump in? Thank you. Um, great to be here, Rob. Thank you for the invitation. Um, the, the, the short answer, the glib answer, I, I really, I, and the honest answer is I really don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, I have been doing this for a few years and um, can't say that I've ever seen anything like it. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, what I would say, first of all, is that um, I think central to, uh, you know, it takes two to tango. And, and um, you know, I think, first of all, uh, on the Chinese side, uh, the Chinese have um, many years of asks, many years of, there's many years of dialogue going back to JCCTs, SEDs, SNEDs, high level dialogues, lots of asks. Claire was a part of developing quite a number of those when she was at USTR. Um, and, and so I think on the systemic issues, the Chinese have a pretty, pretty good idea of the kinds of priorities. Um, that, that U.S. business has, but also that U.S. business shares with the U.S. government. I think there's a, there's a lot of common interests and common viewpoints there on the systemic issues. Um, so, I, you know, I think, you know, the Chinese uh, argument that 
uh, they're not sure what the administration wants. I, I mean, I, I think there's some, I think there's some truth to that, and I'll turn to what I'll turn to the administration side in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's less truth to it, quite frankly, than we might like to admit sometimes. Um, uh, less credibility to that argument. I think the Chinese have a pretty good idea, and in some areas, quite frankly, the Chinese just don't want to do the kinds of things uh, that both the administration and the business community have been asking uh, for for quite some time. Um, on the flip side, uh, the administration um, has not been uh, strategic, um, I would Submit in its approach to China. I think tariffs are an example of that, which the business community, Can you, yeah. <coughs> which the business community uh, um, uh, deeply opposes. Um, but I think taking a step back from the actual uh, remedy, um, the, there's really been th three um, buckets of ass of the Chinese, or, or three priorities of this administration. I think one is deficit reduction. Um, two would be concerns. That would be trade deficit reduction because there's clearly <laughs> not a budget deficit reduction. Right? Sorry. <laughs> two would be um, concerns about Chinese acquisitions of technology here. Uh, also, also uh, issues related to export of technology uh, to China. Um, and the third piece would be the market access and behind the border. Those are the, the, really the systemic issues. Um, uh, I think the you know one and three. Um, um, uh, you know, they're, they're both priorities. If you give the Chinese the option, they're probably going to pick number one <laughs> every day of the week and, and twice on Sunday. Um, uh, that's easier for them. A managed trade solution is easier for them. And so instead mm -hmm. of greater focus or singular focus on the market access, the behind the border regulations that in fact would bring uh, 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 going after the sub ending the subsidies and the other policies that distort markets both inside China and globally, um, the administration to a degree has given the Chinese an off-ramp. Um, and, and, um, and so I think the administration needs a more focused approach. Um, you know, those asks are certainly there, but there's, there's, there, there are competing asks and the Chinese, uh, giving the Chinese um, uh, sort of a choice is, is, is not an optimal um, uh, negotiating approach. So I think, um, again, I think the Chinese need to be willing to do some difficult things. Um, you know, the Chinese pledged to open their electronic payments markets uh, in 2006. We're now in 2018. Um, uh, that's just but one example. Um, and then the administration needs to come with a more focused approach. Great. Thank you. I want to come back to that a little bit later about you know, but I don't know how it's going to. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't sure. see an end in sight right now. Yeah. Can okay. I? Can Go I just yeah. make two um, two points? I do think that what Jeremy's highlighting is the fact that we really one of the things we don't know is what Trump's goals are, because Trump at the end of the day seems to be the only one who is going to be making the decisions on this. And I found it pretty striking after one of the the big delegation went over where we had Treasury, Commerce, USTR, White House senior staff, all over to China. And in the past, they really would have been empowered to make statements and talk about what was going on. And the only statement they made at the end of their visit was, we are now going back to Washington to report to Trump, and we will talk to you later. So that was very striking to me in terms of where the power lies and who's going to call the shots on this. And I think China, by the way, in terms of not knowing what to do, has been trying to figure out, obviously, wh who the interlocutor would be. And I think they're coming to the conclusion that it doesn't matter whether Mnuchin or Ross or anybody's in the front of the line, that it's really going to be figuring out what Trump wants. Um, so that's uh, – now, goals are interesting. I think I agree with Jeremy entirely that China would just like to get out of this in a way that allows it to maintain its control, its stability, deal with its at-home problems – continue its economic development and basically continue its ability to leapfrog technologies and do what it wants to do. Um, 
the question, I guess, for the United States, which I don't think the U.S., I don't know, what do I know? I'm on the outside. <laughs> I'm not sure they've fully grappled with, which is what are our goals for China? So are our goals to remove the trade distorting practices, the things that are just dis distorting the global markets? I think you would say yes to that, probably across the board in the administration and in Congress. But the next question is, are we interested in helping China create a more efficient and market-oriented economy that will actually assist its development and make it, at the end of the day, a stronger competitor with Western countries by virtue of its getting rid of inefficient state-owned enterprises? of letting the markets dictate when companies go bankrupt, having the financial system work better, reducing the perverse incentives on local governments, et cetera, et cetera. Are we interested in that? And I don't know that anybody's really grappled with that question. So I want to come back to goals um, a little bit later, sort of, because I think that is you have to start with that. That's the first question. What do we actually want from the Chinese? But before I do that, um, uh, Derek and, and, and Michael, you've both been, I, maybe others have as well, but I know you've both been talking to the administration, various folks. Um, what are your insights from that, kind of how where we are? Derek, you want to start okay. off? Okay. <clears throat> I don't think this is nearly as unclear as some other people do. The president has a 30-year record where he says he wants to reduce the trade deficit. The trade deficit rose last year. His number one priority is to stop that. And if you bring him a deal on NAFTA or on China that somebody says this is going to cause a trade deficit to rise or it's not going to stop the increase in the trade deficit, it won't work. And that's what happened in May. Um, a deal was brought to him and it had too much water in it in the Chinese offer. And you were going to get a larger trade deficit in 2019 than you were in 2016 on a regular projection. And that was the end of that. Um, so I understand the point that, that Jeremy and Claire are making about what U.S. goals should be. And that's a, you know, we can argue about that. The U.S., what the U.S. goal is, is to reduce the trade deficit or at least stabilize it. And then everything else comes after that. Uh, I think the complicated part in, within the administration is something else. It's related to what Claire said, which is there is a group, uh, I confess that I'm part of this group, that doesn't think we can negotiate with the Chinese, yeah. that they will not keep their word. That the only thing we can do is make them suffer for a while, and then we can have a negotiation. And for a while is not two months. Um, and there is another group, definitely, that thinks, no, yeah, we can. We can threaten them, and then they'll do some things, and things will be better than they were, and you know, then we won't upset the global marketplace and so on. And I actually think the president's in the second group. I think the president does not want a, a, a multi-year conflict with the Chinese that causes him political pain as well as political gain. Um, so... You know, I think that's where the battle is. It's, it, we know what the, the goal of the administration is, led by President Trump. This was a, seen as a crucial issue in his reelection. It is not going to be delegated to one of his cabinet members. The goal is we reduce the trade deficit. And then the, the battle is over, do we, can we trust the Chinese in any deal? Um, and that's, that's what makes it hard to just say, okay, we reduce the trade deficit by $70 billion. We agreed to do that in August. It's done. If we could do that, we'd be finished. Hey, Derek, but can I just a, ask you one question? When you say reduce the trade deficit, mm. China didn't promise to reduce the trade right, deficit. Right, China made more promised, purchases. China promised to purchase more. Right. And the trade deficit, as we know, is mm. not actually fundamentally influenced by decisions like buying a few more goods. So we've got our savings rate and we've got our tax cuts. So I'm having a little trouble figuring out how the... Uh, how this rolls with anybody being able to talk about the trade deficit with China going down in uh, 2019. Uh, why? I mean, I, I don't understand. This is directed really at everyone in the room. I, have you listened to the president? You listened to him when he was a businessman in the 1980s. He doesn't care about the damn savings rate, right? What he cares about is he thinks the trade deficit is a classic protectionist position. Members of the you know, AFL-CIO senior members have had this for years. 
The trade deficit represents lost this position. I'm not advocating for it. Represents lost American jobs. It represents money being stolen. It represents us losing. I don't care about the savings rate. I, I don't that. care about any about that. So he doesn't care about that. What he cares about is someone brings to him a deal where he where they where you can credibly say we haven't addressed any of the underlying problems. The trade deficit is going to rise later, but he will not be running in 2020 with a larger bilateral trade deficit with China than when when he ran again in 2016. So, that's Jeremy, just a, a quick two finger. Two finger. I know, Mike, yeah. I know it's Mike's turn. So um, <laughs> the, the only thing, the only observation, I, I'm not, Derek, I'm, I, I would, I, I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong. The only observation I would offer is that uh, the president had, had, was brought a deal, for example, on steel um, in, in, the, um, in the initial 100-day, at the end of the 100-day plan, um, and uh, that deal was rejected. There were, you know, 230 billion, give probably a somewhat inflated number, but there were, were a significant number of deals, long-term deals, uh, as part of the state visit last November. Um, uh, and and then again, a negotiation, um, you could argue multiple, well, really one negotiation around a purchase agreement focused mm -hmm. primarily on ag yeah. and energy, um, again, which didn't fly. So, um, it may be that the president is, in fact, singularly focused on the trade deficit, but but it seems to me that the bar is pretty high. Bar is pretty high. Those look. I, I'll just. I know Mike should talk here, and he may have more insight. All those <laughs> deals were run through a group of people, including me, to see what we thought about what their effect would be. And the grab the grab was if you couldn't if you couldn't make the strong case that we actually would get the results on the trade deficit that the president perhaps unreasonably wants. Then we're not taking this deal. That was certainly true in November. I thought it was true in May. That's the bar. Sorry, Mike. Go ahead. Okay, Mike. No, no. <laughs> you having a good time? <laughs> I came to learn. Is this? <laughs> uh, I was on the Trump transition team up in, up in Trump Tower in, in New York, and as a scholar, I decided I would read all of President Trump's books. He has fourteen books. Uh, and several of them talk about China. As you say, a lot of them talk about the trade deficit. There's often a foreign policy section of some of these books. Uh, by the way, the one that came out in uh, spring of 2000 uh, called The America We Deserve, uh, President Trump says, if I run this year, he meant the year 2000, uh, my running mate will be Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, I learned many things by reading through the president-elect's uh, books and talking to his advisors, uh, he set up a China team. We were the only country, China was the only country that had a team actually set up in, in Trump Tower. Uh, I think in part because of the president's deep interest in, interest in China. So I guess I could highlight where I differ. For, I agree with most of what the three of you have said already. We can't have a big you know, slug fest up here. <laughs> but yeah, uh, small where, one. Where, yeah. where I right. I mean, just I'll tell, tell me what I, position uh, to take. I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I. <laughs> I'll tell you where I differ. I think the uh, President Trump sees China in a more holistic, larger scale way than just trade issues. So yes, he would like a trade deficit deal of some kind. Um, hasn't seen it yet. But I think the fact that he's made more than, uh, some say it's as high as 30 now, some say more than that, long phone calls to President Xi. This is not to bicker about trade deficit or tariffs. This is a larger strategic relationship um, that covers many things. And it seems to me to understand, I, I really like, uh, you, Rob, your article here on decoding China's responses. I was just in China at a couple of conferences two weeks ago, trying to see you know, how they assess uh, the topic you have today of what's next. And what I found was they are applying a lot of concepts from their ancient statecraft, from the Warring States period, and today from what they call the United Front Work Department. They are analyzing something about what Derek said about the, he said two groups. They seem to see more than that. They right, see, there there are three groups, yeah. Um, and they're doing a kind of testing. They have a wonderful phrase for it called chow liang, which we often translate as arm wrestling. But they're trying to determine the, the power, if you will, of these different groups that they see actually inside the White House. 
they don't think it's think tanks outside. They think it's right, right around the president. And this, for them, which tariffs are selected and what the rates are when they go into effect, uh, they see seem to see as part of a larger game of what do the Americans want to do uh, now that China is closing in on po potentially surpassing American GDP and becoming the number one country in the world. The Chinese have been thinking about how to handle the Americans in this uh, phase for a long time. They put, even put forward an idea to President Obama, which he rejected, um, that there should be a new model of great power relations in Chinese for you Chinese speakers here it's called Xin Xin Da Guo Guanxi and you have to ask yourself what President Obama asked his team well what is the old model <laughs> that you want to replace <laughs> well the old model is that whenever a new challenging power surpasses the old hegemon a war breaks out usually a very serious war either started by the old hegemon to defend his or her position or started by the uh, challenger and the new model is supposed to avoid that. So part of the new model was explained through think tanks and delegations that we Chinese will guarantee your American hegemony for 100 years. As long as you forswear the use of force or extreme measures to prevent our emerging as the number one economy in the world, first surpassing you, then going on to be double you, They've got a, a couple of books have come out about what it will be tw in 2049. They'll be triple us. Utter nonsense, but yes. Well, no. They yeah. have it. I understand. I was, I'm not disagreeing that was my you, next, right. That was my next <laughs> sentence. They, they don't to give any credence at all to the number of books and articles we have, starting with Gordon Chang, The Coming Collapse of China, back in 2001. A little early. We have a, we have a huge uh, group of scholars who have convinced themselves China is either in a trap transition or going to collapse, or certainly mm -hmm. have a major slowdown in its in its growth rate. And that's where you your point is really excellent about uh, have we thought through? Have we as a country thought through? Mm -hmm. We may end up helping China's efficiency and growth rate, even as we seek to punish them for what we consider unfair trade practices. Um, that's really a major question. The Chinese actually, with if they could hear you say that. They would say, wow, the smartest person on the panel is that woman in the middle. <laughs> because for China, back, back to Rob's, I just want to make a final point here. Back to Rob's idea that there are several possible outcomes. One, obviously, is Trump wins. President Trump gets what he wants. I think it's not just the trade deficit. I think it's also some movement in intellectual property, uh, U.S. investment companies having better access in China. There's a, there seems to be a, if you look at USTR's writings and the famous eight points, everybody here should have read the eight points. The eight points are President Trump's negotiating position. The paper was given to the Chinese. They leaked it. Then they apologized and took it down, but the whole world had seen it. It's these eight sections, um, which are seem to be co-equal, Derek. Doesn't privilege, yeah, we definitely disagree on this point. Doesn't tri privilege, uh, and you're, you're talking about but the president's personal preferences. Yes, he may prefer a trade deficit first. His books suggest that. But that's not what USTR mm. handed over to the Chinese. Right. So this is one of the things they try to analyze, splits in the American team. They have heard our ambassador, uh, Branstad, they've heard Wilbur Ross speak uh, somewhat wistfully about a deal, a near-term deal. So for them, that's one point of view. There is a way to get a near-term deal, back to your listing of the outcomes. Uh, a win-win, as the Chinese would say, in which there's some movement. This seems to be what their idea was by offering 60 or 70 billion additional purchase of American exports. Um, by President Xi's c having committed for several years that he's against intellectual property theft. He seems to be shocked by <laughs> these allegations that state-owned enterprises or even the Commerce Ministry are doing these bad things. So there's movement there for President Xi to take some enforcement uh, actions. On the WTO issue, uh, there's a bigger clash, frankly. If we're, if we're going to block all new judges being appointed, the WTO is not going to be able to rule in our favor at all because it'll be stymied. So I see these eight points as being uh, bargaining uh, areas in which the Chinese have made offers in some of the eight points, 
But as Rob says in this piece, they're also engaged in a full-scale uh, sort of united front effort to echo back the, who, they, who they consider to be enlightened Americans. And I brought you China Daily today. They do this with four Americans. They've got huge quotations from them in two or three stories. So they amplify the voices of those Americans and are testing to see what is the Trump bottom line here? What would satisfy him? And the maximum position on the Trump side, they have rejected. They're not going to buy 200 billion more per year American exports. But they've offered 60 or 70 billion. So negotiable. The question I would leave you with, are the other seven of the points also negotiable in the near term? Because one school of thought is, as Derek, I think, was saying, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I think you're saying that one group wants a quick deal, quick in the sense of a few months. Um, I think there's a team in China that wants that. I think it's consistent with their long-term concern about not upsetting the Americans too much about Chinese hegemony. So, there, however, there's another group in China which seems to be associated with the state-owned enterprise leaders, and they want, they're not afraid, shall we say, of punishment. This group was very uh, triumphal when I was there two weeks ago, saying, we already prepared our countermeasures. We, within hours, can put our countermeasures on. So this is a kind of feisty group that wants to fight. And Derek, I submit, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I submit they uh, are in for the long slugging match, kind of attrition, and make the Americans make, make an offer first. So that leads to, for me, that leads to a really long-term, what Rob is saying in his opening comments, a kind of permanent tariff world. So, thank you, Mike. Let me drill down on a couple of things. I, I, um, I have to comment on your point about win-win. I was talking to a CEO of a U.S. company that had gone to China and lost miserably. Mm -hmm. And he said, when the Chinese use the word win-win, it means they win twice. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but... I always go back to thinking about one of the uh, innovation SNEDs we did, Claire, or I did. I was involved in because I was co-chair of the Obama Innovation Group. And, and I remember <laughs> seeing the Chinese delegation uh, that spend the entire day with them. And they were, as they say, uh, you know, they were uh, speaking the party line. They were on message. There was no deviation from the core message. And then I watched uh, d different official from, you know, the undersecretary of this, the secretary of this come in and basically have four different messages during the day. And it's like... From the American side. From the American yeah. side. And so what is our message? You know, it was clear what the Chinese message was. There were three messages. Every single speaker reinforced those three messages. And I think that's an inherent part of our problem here is what is the message? And, you know, Derek, you kind of think it's tariffs. I'm a little more with you, Mike. I think it's more than that. But let me just say what I think our position is of what it should be is I don't think tariffs matter. I, I think the Chinese are, have, will give up some of that. It fundamentally doesn't matter to our future. Or you can argue whether it's because of our savings rate, which I don't buy into that much or whatever. I think the fundamental question is essentially 20, made in China 2025, broadly defined, their attempt to gain dominance in advance. Which we've asked them to cancel that program. That's one of the eight points. Sure. No, I, I get that. Cancel in Chinese, by the way, is too deep get rid of. This is horrifying to them. Well, but see, I, it's another point. I don't think we can ask you. I don't think been, we can ask you to cancel. It has been canceled by the media, in yeah. the media. <laughs> Propaganda <laughs> department. Is, no more, no <laughs> more, no more yeah, speaking. Nobody in China dares to discuss. That's like but yeah, when 2025 anymore. When we, if you all For remember the, the indigenous <laughs> innovation <laughs> product catalog fight, yep. the, uh, the state, uh, there was a big thing, and the state council sends out a message to all the provincial governments a week after the delegation had, and it said, in Chinese, the translation was, you are no longer allowed to put this in writing or to talk about it. It wasn't that they canceled it. But I think, I, actually, I don't, this is where I don't agree with that. I don't think we should tell them to cancel 2025. I think we should tell them to cancel the unfair uh, mercantilist components of 2025. And this is where I think we, we make a mistake. I don't, I don't think we should say to the Chinese, we we're not going to let you advance technologically. I don't think that's our right. They have every right to do that. I think what we can say is get rid of your integrated circuit uh, $160 billion fund. Uh, stop doing forced JV. Stop doing forced tech transfer. All those other means that are unfair. So I guess 
Professor, I'd just like to ask you, does everybody sort of agree with my framing of that, or would you go br more broader than that? Because that, my worry was, is that we're not pushing them. We can't win, we can't win all eight points. We're not going to be able to do that, so we've got to pick and choose our battles. I, I just say I, I think the business community absolutely agrees with that view, that it, the issue is, is, not, is not about restraining China's ability to be an innovative country and become an innovative country. It's about a competitive country, uh, to have strong Chinese companies. It's about the how. It's always been about the how. Um, what are, the, what are the, the laws, policies, practices that China employs to get there? And, and uh, that's been, for many years, the, the, law, the, the focus of, of the business community, uh, not just the American business community, but the European business community, the Japanese business community, the Korean business community. I mean, you, you look at any of the reports that chambers of commerce around the world now issue um, focused on China, and, um, and you know, they're almost interchangeable. The issues are the same. The concerns are the same, and that's one of the great, um, I think, you know, uh, one one of the most unfortunate things about about the approach that we're seeing unfold here. The U.S. Uh, the current U.S. approach is that it it really is um, it's not playing off that shared analysis, the shared concern. It's it's in fact we have a widening gap, gulf between. Um, the U.S. and our allies uh, on many issues, but in particular, um, uh, that 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 widening gulf um, is is impairing the ability to do work together to deal with some of the very legitimate, long-standing concerns uh, that um, that we have about China. I, th I think, um, you know, I, I think the the question of deficits, you know, is. Part of the problem with the deficit, well, the, the, the metric, I think, is, is, is a questionable one, highly questionable one. Um, we certainly don't agree with it in the, at the chamber and in the business community. Um, but um, I think equally important, it's inherently a short-term, uh, a very short-term fleeting solution. Um, I think the Chinese probably know that. That's why they're... <laughs> <laughs> That's why they'd be happy to do a deal, or more willing to do a deal around uh, deficit reduction. And I think, um, and that's why the business community has instead focused on the systemic issues. Um, and, and I think this gets to Claire's um, the, the, some of what Claire was saying earlier about the nature of reform in China. Um, China often, going back many years, talks about you know when it, when it talks about reform, um, um, bird uh, you know bird in the cage, right? Um, I think what we're kind of asking for is um, is for the bird to be allowed to fly out of the cage on on these economic issues. Um, uh, I think you know there's a lot of reform going on in China. Um, there's there, there's uh, um, mergers of large state-owned enterprises and even larger state-owned enterprises. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. It, it's, 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 it doesn't count as reform. It's, <laughs> well, it counts no, as it's reform. Not, it's not. It's, it's not, not market. Western. <laughs> it's not market-based form. Right, market-based right. reform. It's not. It's not the kinds of reforms that we want to see, but it's reform. It's reform in, 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 in terms based on what the party wants and has decided is in China's interest or in the party's interest. Um, and um, you know, in some areas, we've seen actual backsliding. So what we're seeing not is you know, it's not just about reform. It's not just about bird in the cage. It's a bird in, in a in a steel or titanium reinforced cage with lots of locks on the door. For example, when you look at the, the, the data policies that we see, uh, the data policies, the cyber policies, um, it's, it's antithetical. It's the antithesis of support for globalization. When you consider the role that the Internet has played. I have 60 seconds. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I want, to stay uh, so on, I want to stay on this point of, of kind of 2025. What's, what is our goal? So, and uh, so, Mike. There is a win-win solution. Um, Real win, win including uh, subsidies for making China 2025. And it's along the lines of the, I'll call them the extreme reformers in China. Uh, in a sense, that those who have PhDs in economics who are inside the Chinese government and have their hands on the controls, they emerge sometimes. And the uh, most dramatic example probably is a World Bank 
a report together with the NDRC yeah. as co-sponsors uh, that Leo He supposedly had a hand in the work of the research at the time uh, called China 2030. And there's and an this, update of that coming, I believe. I hope so. And this was the kind of China you're talking about, much more efficient. Um, that group still there, but it looks like President Xi swung away from them. And he swung toward the other group, which I call it in advertising my book, The Hundred Year Marathon. I, I talk about the hawks versus doves, which is not exactly the right words to use. But the other group is the 1600 economists in China in 2005 or 2006, who wrote a long letter attacking Mao Yushu when he got the, you know, who got the Cato Award. Um, this group, we could demonize them and call them the Stalinist or the state-owned enterprise anti-reformers. They are in some sense helped by a tariff uh, war, whereas the reformers, who ought to be our natural allies, if we want a more efficient Chinese economy and a faster Chinese growth rate, those people could step forward and say, look, we need to clean up a lot of these practices. And this group is using the term uh, continue opening up. Whenever you heard, hear the phrase or you see in Chinese propaganda the term uh, to continue with opening up, that means you're probably hearing from what I'm calling the doves or the reformers or the Harvard people. I hate to pick Harvard. Derek, what's a better? Chicago? Chicago. Chicago Damn PhDs right. in China. <laughs> uh, I could be uh, engaged in wishful thinking yet again, but I have a hunch that this win-win solution involves their further opening up team getting together with our more uh, moderate advisors to President Trump and that therein lies some kind of a deal across all eight points. I just pulled out the eight points again to refresh my memory. Uh, USTR, or someone, I won't accuse them, someone gave the eight points to Bloomberg. So I don't know if you have it on the ITIF website, but you can actually have the text. Um, yes, that's where it was put up, and then it was taken down at the American so, request. There are also detailed annexes under these eight points, I think. Which yes, not, right here. You have the annexes. Um, but the point is, win-win involves our nurturing and understanding the debate in Beijing and trying to forbid ourselves from ever saying China wants or the Chinese think. No, it, you would not say that about the White House. You wouldn't say Peter Navarro you know, agrees with everybody else. No, everybody's aware of Peter Navarro's views from his report that we hosted at Hudson uh, last week. His views are different from other members of President Trump's team. but. If we can see the vision from the China 2030 and I hope Rob it's update, we can see that, the, that the, the terms of a deal what President Trump would be happy with, they exist. They exist. The question is, is, is to use the analogy well, here. We have no it, bargaining channel. Is it Mnuchin going to win or is, is it Navarro going to win? It's the same question in China. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, again, I would just. I guess differ a little bit in terms of um, not that the terms of a deal aren't possible don't exist, but um, I think again a metric of having a more efficient um, Chinese economy. Uh, China can have absolutely, and I think will have over the coming years a more efficient econ economy. I, I, I'm actually a, I'm I think um, there's widespread recognition. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you look at the, the concerns about financial risk that are, you know, woven into um, uh, woven into the 19th Party Congress, uh, you know, as a top priority. Um, uh, obviously, um, you know, so sometimes the priorities are are shelved or moved aside as the so you think our strategy should be not to let no. China collapse no 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 right? my, 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 my only point I'm, I'm no, not no, 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 I'm my, not for a China I'm not for a collapse of China my, my only point is I'm attracted to a more efficient China my, I guess more of a free market like 80 percent of their economy we, would we be in a the free market community absolutely mm -hmm. want to see a, a more market led I, I think as an know, American goal the, the great hope I think in the business community Going back to, to 2013, 2012, 2013, when we saw President Xi take the reins, um, 
was that we would see a an economy that was uh, driven by market forces. To, you know that market forces would would play an uh, an overriding goal in, in the allocation of resources in the economy. And there was actually but it didn't a, happen. a fair amount of optimism, uh, yeah. and it didn't happen. The and Hawks so, won, and so I think. But I, but I think in looking at it, it's really um, the, I think openness perhaps is a better metric to you. Efficiency is important. We want to see the sub, you know subsidies. Look, every, everyone has a, has a measure of subsidies, so I think we, have, we do have to be careful uh, uh, about that issue. It's, it's, the, it's the size, scope, and, 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 and role of, of, of the uh, um, uh, and, and distortive impact of, the, of, of subsidies um, and, and, and how that relates to comparative advantage. But I, I think that um, when you consider, when you look at data policies, cyber policies, um, I put subsidies in there, but standards and competition policy. Um, it's China's moving to a more, within China, on the face of it, a more open economy. Uh, the, the, the movement to a negative list, right? We, we saw an updated negative list recently. We look at what Xi Jinping um, said at, at the Boao Forum. I think these are all the the uh, the, the problem is is that the, the 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 tangible reforms on the ground and priority priority areas for American companies are lagging that rhetoric. And then when we see some of these behind-the-border regulatory policies that impair the ability to compete, we see, again, continued use of administrative licensing. So I, want to, I want to move on to Claire and, and, and Derek. Thoughts on, on this sort of broader question of 2025 and, and what our goals are and how one, we succeed? One thing I would note is in the leaked document that was the, uh, the U.S. Um, demands of China, they don't ask that 2025 be dismantled. They only ask that the subsidies trade dismantled. trade distorting market distorting subsidies, and there are lots of subsidies. So they're not even saying don't provide R and D, you know, credits in your tax system. They're not saying that. They're saying market distorting subsidies. So we have to be careful about what the well. I mean, it's it's nobody's taking formal uh, responsibility for that. But we have to be careful about where, where those demands are. Um, my, my personal sense is that there's absolutely no way that China is going to abandon its desire to leapfrog frog technologically. And I think that um, maybe reflecting, maybe because I'm sitting next to Derek, I'm reflecting a little. It's always my fault. <laughs> it's, I, I think we have seen that where where China's um, interests diverge from the formal, um, well, I don't know how to say this, from, from, a, from, a, from a position that they have taken with the United States to try to remove a trade tension, that what will happen is, is that you don't violate necessarily, but you find all the ways to work around. And there are many, many ways to work around um, uh, actual commitments that have been made. So that, that makes it very difficult when I think about it to think that we realistically can create a Made in China 2025 compromise policy with China where we can go home and sleep well at night. Well, I guess, Claire, the question I know there are people who say they're not willing to do anything on 2025, and I, and I think I don't have that view. I have the view that, first of all, I have the view that if we, if we walk away and there's no deal on 2025, egregious practices, it is, what's the point? And just don't even bother. And I think, do you think that they would be willing to say, for example, uh, in their integrated circuit fund, uh, 110, 160 billion, whatever it is, you got to cut that down to $10 billion? Or... No more enforced JVs. See, I think there's a difference between no more enforced JVs, where they real, real forced, you know, real right, result, real not, real results, yeah. not just titular results. Yeah. But sorry, joint, joint ventures, ventures, forced joint yeah. ventures with American companies on technology. Uh, I think that's one thing. I think ha telling them how much money they should pour into strategic technologies is a very different thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I just I'm, I'm they're gonna, not all I'm, the same. Also, though, I mean, I think to talk about, I mean, I think you have semiconductors, which the Chinese may be, be willing to negotiate 
more so in certain areas of made in China 2025 and come arguably encompasses 50 sure. percent of the Chinese economy. And so to to assume that semiconductors and medical devices or ag equipment, which is also part of made in China 2025, are all the same and the policies are uniform and, and moving forward, um, I think is. All right, Derek, any thoughts on this? And if not, I want to ask you a different question. Well, I'm going to just dismiss it. Um, the Chinese have had industrial policy from the beginning of the, of the foundation of the PRC. They had it in the reform period. This is just more became more con a concern because it reaches into more advanced technology, which directly falls from their development stage. So I, I don't find this like, oh, my God, this is a big change from the Chinese. It's not a big change from the Chinese. Uh, I don't think, Mike, it is at all right that we have a chance to get the reformers couldn't even win when Hu Jintao was in charge, and he was a complete non-entity. Um, the only way you you, you get a you, you get a change in Chinese policy if Xi Jinping believes this is a a, a better way to organize the economy. We've already seen him show very clearly he does not. The Chinese don't have an alternative to industrial policy, the way to organize their economy, because there's nobody at a high level who believes in that. Not that not that there aren't people who could propose it. So you know we're gonna get Chinese industrial policy um, for sure. Uh, and hoping for reform is misguided. And the question is whether, as Jeremy just sort of suggested, and I, I'm not saying he agrees with this point, whether the areas where the Chinese will give are acceptable to us. In other words, if, if they're never going to give on semiconductors and we have to have them give on semiconductors, we can't make a deal. If they're like, all right, these we, we, we laid out these eight industries, they're going to change. Um, you know, th th that's the way their industrial policy always works. They have an industrial policy statement, they modify it, new priorities come up. If we can find out what their real, their, their, their sort of unabandonable, if that's not actually a word, but their, <laughs> I don't want to just say top, because everything's a top priority if you read Chinese media. We have 17 new priorities coming out from the state council. But the ones they won't give on, if they, if they, if we can ha find out whether there's an intersection or not of what they won't give on and what we absolutely have to have for strategic purposes, then we can make a deal. Uh, I don't think we know what we absolutely have to have for strategic purposes, because I think the econ side of this negotiation uh, on the U.S. side and the strategic side, which we haven't talked about, which is Mattis and Bolton uh, and maybe Pompeo, uh, don't coordinate. So I don't think we can actually negotiate that. And if we did have a position, I bet we couldn't get the Chinese to agree to it. So I just, so, my point is industrial policy is, is, is ceaseless, it. and we could negotiate the details of the industrial policy in principle, but I don't. I think that's highly unlikely. Derek, let me push back on that for two reasons. <clears throat> One, uh, uh, to me, that's the entire thing. If, if that's not what we're fighting, let's walk away. Let's go do something else. And that is what we're fighting. And that's what's my original point about you can't negotiate. Well, I do think we can. Uh, two, two things. One, as you said, that's a natural thing for their development stage. I completely disagree with that. Uh, there's a really good study by the, you'll know his name, the guy who was really a high. He, Escaped from Taiwan to China, an economist, and was at the World Bank. Um, Vice President of the World Bank and Chief Economist. Yeah, thank you. Lin Yifu. Is that so, so he yeah, wrote, okay. I believe it was him, wrote a very good report that said this is what countries at that middle stage of development should be doing on technology, and the last thing they should be doing at that development stage is trying to be good at leading edge, global, cutting edge innovation. They should be focusing on kind of incremental. So they don't need to be doing this, and by doing it, they're completely distorting the global innovation. Look, I'm not arguing with you about that. But no, 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 let me, let me right. make a second point. <laughs> I think one of the problems with how the U.S. frames this, because of our sort of deep commitment to neoclassical economics, we can only see sort of two models. There's sort of this free market, you know, uh, kind of Anglo-Saxon model, or there's this completely heavy-handed, distortive Chinese model. And I get that the Chinese will never embrace our model, never. But that doesn't mean they can't embrace a sort of middle ground industrial policy model that is not as distortive. So for example, think about a model like uh, you know, what some of the Scandinavian countries are doing or what Singapore is doing. I mean, Singapore is generally a market economy, but they really, really have sophisticated policies to move up the value chain. And I don't. Dis I completely disagree that we should say to China, "You have to be like us." But I also think we can say, "You got to be more like Singapore." And to me, that is a reasonable ask to make for them. I, I mean, I have two responses. First of all, a Singapore at the size of China, you would find much more distorting than you find Singapore right now. The reason we let Singapore get away with the things that they do is because it's a city, and we don't care. It, um, they don't. <laughs> 
they they do not do they don't do the ma- the thing they don't they don't do as much absolutely because don't they, they don't have, they don't have as many sectors no, as it's, China does. It's that it's not no, a question of why, Derek. It's a question of what they're doing. Yeah, my, but, my but point that, is there is a middle ground no, on this. Okay, stuff. there is a, there is a middle ground. Thank Singapore you. doesn't represent it. Um, it doesn't, fine, pick okay. whatever country you want. There, but there the, is a middle ground right. to it that we should insist. There is a middle ground. I agree with that in principle, and I also agree that you know I don't think that the Chinese should be at this point you know trying to become the world leader in telecom equipment as a middle income country, but. You lost that battle. The reformers lost. They lost. They didn't lose. They got crushed. They've been crushed for fifteen so years. What do we do? So is this, <laughs> I mean, if, so, I mean, if, if we don't we're fight, not, if like, we don't fight that fight, fight like, if we don't fight that fight, what is the fight? We're, what is the fight we're fighting? <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> Um, Some what, had their website. What, what is the, the fight we're, we're, still, we're, we're still fighting? Um, you know, Mike was talking about uh, the sense of, of triumph. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a medium-lived, not necessarily a short-lived sense of triumph. But nonetheless, I mean, we, had, we have no reason for the Chinese to move toward mm-hmm. this, this more palatable industrial policy unless they suffer some harm. Right and and talking about it, which is the kind of cheap, let's get a qu- cheap, quick deal, doesn't really su- mean harm. They think the group that's in charge, that's been in charge since Zhu Rongji left office, so it's 15 years now, thinks this works fine. It's not perfect. They, they, they don't never have to tweak as it. As long as there's, there's no corruption, punishment, as you say, as long as there's no harm and punishment applied. But right. that's what's starting. Right. Well, I mean, and, 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 and more my, and more CFIUS denials right. that hurts. So, so my more and more demands so we have for U.S. A, exports that so we, hurts. We have a question of the punishments are going to continue to go right. up. I think and, from, the, and, from President and Trump's if you uh, want, statements. Right. If you want the more fundamental solution, as opposed to the quick, let's make a deal solution, you have to stick with that those kind of punishments for several years. You can get a quick deal well, on assuming uh, they're not going to give in in a couple of years. Uh, the question is, the question to me is all about pain. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they could say, they could sort of see the handwriting on the wall in four months when we impose a tariff on every single Chinese import, and they could say they want to give a deal, or they could say, well, we'll see how long it lasts politically and wait two years. I mean, that's one question. I mean, I, I do worry, I have to say, I do worry that this is, this is perhaps um, a little, it strikes me as a bit of an academic discussion. I mean, we're talk, we are talking about real-world impacts um, right now. Um, We're talking about White on, House policy debates, well, high that, level Chinese that, policy <laughs> debates. Certainly, that, that is it's not academic. <laughs> well, that, the Chinese it, told me there's a huge but, split but in it, the Chamber of Commerce. But it is the <laughs> Washington Chamber of Commerce is pro-China. The Chamber of Commerce in China calls explicitly for tough policies and pain against Chinese industrial policy. I don't so think, I hope, you, I'm not hope sure, you're aware of the I'm not split sure within Ch- the chamber. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, no, I'm not sure which Chinese it's official. Not academic. I'm not sure which Chinese official uh, you heard that from. But I, I get uh, my, my my sense is that that Chinese official is not very well informed. I think. I think. The, By the, the way, the, the chamber, US, the, the, US head chamber of the, the head of the Chinese are, Chamber of are, Commerce in Beijing, your friend, I assume, was present. He stood up and he agreed with the Chinese official. Uh, 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 my, he called my, for tougher policies on China. Well, my, 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 I wasn't. Uh, the anyway, big banquet, look, my only eighty point, people. My, my, my only point here is that <laughs> we are in a period. We are in a. I, I think there is agreement about a lot of. There's shared. There's a common viewpoint. Common. Um, there's shared concern about pretty much all of these policies, and the analysis is a common one. Again, it's not just. I think. Between the administration and the business community, but also business communities and governments in Berlin, in Tokyo, in Brussels, and so on. And so another forth. Chinese nightmare is what you just said okay. that we'll bring allies in with us well, we're not on doing, these tariffs we're not, we're not, and on investment on restrictions. Tariff, I mean, but we're not doing talking that. about we're, Derek's point about we're, more we're, pain. We're pushing. I, I, look, that could be next in President was, Trump's approach. In a, bring the allies as, in as the administration China. widens the aperture and goes. From I think what was already a point of deep concern of of, of soon to be 50 billion in tariffs potentially to 250 by by early September, um, and then the retaliation uh, that we're seeing um, uh, against uh, uh, industrial interests and and agricultural interests primarily in red states, um, uh, you know, and now as again as the aperture is widening. Um, Greater impact on American consumers. Um, I have a question when support. Jeremy's for uh, Jeremy when he's wrap up, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy's yeah. filibustering because mm-hmm. well, I'm not, I'm the just, split I, I, within I just, the chamber. I just, I, I do. <laughs> Chinese know about the split. Okay, you should acknowledge it too. All right, Derek. Well, look, I, so, I, my, I, no, I have a, let, let, Jeremy, let me ask you a question. 
You're about it's to just, get. It's just a myth. You're about it's to get the. Accurate. You're, right. you're about right. to get right. the. Yeah, I don't agree with the Mike view of the chamber. <laughs> um, but but let me ask you a question because I and I know I, this is unfair because I'm making you speak for the business community. Maybe Claire wants to answer. Somebody can answer. Can answer. I get all the time. Yeah, you prob <laughs> probably probably we pick someone in the audience. Debate after all, aren't we? I thought you, there'd be no debate I, today. What I, I what I can't what I get what I have struggle with is you know better than I do all the things that the Chinese need to change. I focus on a few big things. You can go into greater detail. And then you don't like the tariffs, which I understand. How the hell are we going to get the Chinese to change? I'm tired of hearing, not from you, because you and I know each other and we talk privately, but from major business <laughs> officials saying, oh, well, you know, it's terrible. I agree with the president that the Chinese need to change, but we can't use these tariffs. And then there's nothing. We should talk to them. We tried that already. Yeah, it doesn't that. work. So what I want is 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 whether you 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 know speaking for the business community because you know that's the you know that's what you need to do is is how you get the Chinese to change without using tariffs which are not you know are at best a mixed blessing as an approach but without saying like well we need to explain to them that this is a serious so, issue because I know on. you know that hold on hold on Derek 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 hold on hold on stop. I want to be, I know there's a bunch of media here. I want to turn it over to questions no later than five minutes. Okay. So I be want, very quick in your response, I want <laughs> three, <laughs> I'm going to ask three specific questions. <laughs> One is to Derek, 30 second answer. Uh, Jeremy, let's do the second question, which is uh, Are there other tools? What right. would they be if you don't want to do tariffs? And then there's a third quick question. So no more than 60 seconds, Jeremy. Are there other tools? What would they be? What's it? Yeah, I, I think there there are other tools. Some of the tools are being worked on um, as we speak. I mean, there's an NDAA conference. Firma is is uh, is is being uh, conferenced right now. Um, uh, the, ch the chamber and, the, and 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 many in the business community have endorsed both the uh, both the Senate and House efforts tied to Firma uh, reform. And of course, the president has also endorsed Firma. So I think. The issue of um, uh, on the investment side, I think there's there's uh, a, a recognition, uh, certainly uh, 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 that we need to do everything we need to do to protect nas U.S. national security. Um, uh, um, I think, look, there are opportunities here to to look. The TP, look, uh, this is not something that the administration supports, but the TPP would have been the TPP <laughs> weaving together a, a, a network of higher standard agreements. <laughs> it includes state disciplines on state-owned enterprises, on competition policy, on antitrust, on subsidies, um, on ICT policies, to include encryption, which Rob, you probably will recall, was part of of the TPP. Again, not sufficient. I, I would say necessary, uh, necessary but insufficient. I think the U.S. had an opportunity, ha still has an opportunity to develop proposals for the Europeans, for the Japanese. Uh, USTR, there are a lot of smart people at USTR to, to draft proposals for plurilateral agreements, present them to Anything the Europeans. Anything else specifically on China? That would, that would help. But what else can we do specifically on China? We got FIRMA. Anything else? Claire? Look, they're, they're, well, not even, Okay, from my perspective, the only thing we're going to get in a deal with China is something that China wants. Okay? So you can put tariffs on China all you want. And at the end of the day, the only things that they're going to do are things that they don't believe are contrary to their strategic interests. So what are those things? They may be some of the things that some of those reformers want that can be sold as not harming China's trajectory. Okay, but I think it's going to be a limited number of things. And I think that we have to also recognize that there is a changed environment in America. The changed environment in America is much more mistrust of China, a sense of how many deals can you cut, and therefore the environment is going to be shifting. I think my gut reaction to some of the things the administration has been doing is that they're really trying to pull up roots for multinational corporations and redirect them out of China. So I see this as being a situation where ultimately the, the, the equilibrium will be reset with some kind of limited deal with China on some things, and then there's going to be this overall redirection of environment and of orientation that the administration is going to try to foster through a lot of different channels. Uh, just quickly, Derek and I both testified yesterday at House Foreign Affairs uh, Subcommittee on uh, 
terrorism and trade. Uh, There's actually two subcommittees, Asia Pacific subcommittee too. Right. We had two chairmen, two ranking members. It's very amusing. <laughs> it was a good hearing uh, with oh, Bill Wrench. Is it online? I can go watch yeah. it. Yeah. It is online. Yeah. Uh, but the point I made was I don't think we're going to be able to win this. I, I don't, you know, I wish we could think that. I don't think we're going to be able to win it. So what my testimony was all about, although I've written in other places, how we need to do better to speed up, was how can we throw roadblocks in their way? How can we slow them down? One of the things would be using antitrust authorities to go after some of the state-owned enterprising. A firm is another example. There's, there's two ways to impose pain on China. One is because we think we're going to get a deal, and the other is to just slow them down. Uh, and I'm skeptical the first is ever going to work, but maybe I'm wrong. So, Derek, I wanted to ask you a quick question, which is uh, maybe a 30-second one. They can get out of their tariff harm at least at 10% by devaluing uh, the yuan. Do you think that's – am I right? Uh, how much of that is – they, are they going to be able to sidestep the pain through devaluation? Oh, they can subsidize over a 10% tariff. Uh, if we wanted to – if we wanted – to, to make this a serious effort, which I don't think we should do yet. I think we should go through a process and so on. But if we wanted to be serious about tariffs, we'd have to raise the tariff. Um, they could use the yuan. They have to be very controlled in the, in the depreciation of the yuan against the dollar not, so as not to trigger capital flight, which we've seen before. They're very well aware of that. They can just directly subsidize over it. They can pick the areas where they want to keep their market share in the U.S. and directly subsidize. 10% isn't high enough. It's high enough to hurt them a little bit, get their attention. It's not high enough to actually inhibit the trade if they want to if they want to maintain it so maybe Claire this is to you but maybe a couple. the thing we haven't really talked about today and you don't you hear a little bit about it is the Chinese have vastly more weapons than we do uh, we you know we're debating what what to do with ZTE and even even within that it's a pretty narrow set of things we could do around one particular company because of one violation Chinese can do whatever they want to any US company that has some kind of business relationship with China anytime they want they can hold up things at the border. They can bring antitrust cases. They can say, oh, I'm sorry, your permit is denied. Uh, they have unlimited weapons, really. And I guess the question is, how worried should we be about that kind of retaliation? Well, uh, South Korea with the THAAD missiles was a, a kind of classic example of the sorts of things that, that China would do. You know, all of a sudden, South Korea was a very popular tourist destination, but no tourists wanted to go. Um, and uh, inspections of major Korean companies inside China that caused some of them to have to shut down, and uh, border inspections. And, and we certainly have seen all of those, uh, as well as use of other regulatory powers um, to put pressure on. So, so we've seen that. The, the interesting twist for me in some ways is with China taking the, you know, when you go low, we go high, with that being the expressed approach that they're taking, it's going to be very interesting because, you know, query whether they can maintain credibility if that's their approach. You know, we're the globalists, you know, interested in multilateral institutions and stability of the global trading system, and we're not, you know, going to do anything untoward. Is going to be how they manage that message against what they do inside China. So um, it, it's curious to me. I'm I'm going to be interested to see how they balance that. Uh, what I see as a conflict. Well, let me open it up. Uh, particularly if I could ask if there's media first uh, and uh, right up here and, and hold on to the mic and if there's a say who you are, who you're with. If there's a particular question to somebody, just uh, say that. Um. Jia Mengjie with Taishi Media. Thank you for your insights. So my question is, uh, if there, if it's possible, uh, when can we expect a uh, ice breaking? And if there is a deal, how would the deal look like? Thank you. Uh, I think there's going to be a deal in August. I think it's going to be focused on the trade deficit. And I think we, not I think, we have already had the, the logistics negotiations have already started. Um, now that doesn't mean that they will lead to anything, but I think they will. So no, that's not true. <laughs> They're not talking about substance yet. They're trying to figure out, as, as everyone here who follows this issue is aware, you know, there, we had the, the vice premier come. He's supposed to, you know, he was Xi Jinping's personal economic advisor. That didn't work. Um, we sent a delegation over, as my colleagues on the panel have talked about, uh, which appeared to be, you know, very heavily, you know, highly staffed U.S. delegation. That didn't work. So there is this question of how are we going to set up something that will actually hold uh, within the American political process. So they're not at the level of talking about the offers and what to do. They're at the level of how to do this 
those talks have started, I know. Um, I don't know whether they will lead anywhere. Now I'm just giving my opinion. My opinion is that they will, and that in the middle of August or so, we will have some sort of deal announced that will last a year and a half. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, we, you want if if you want the the tariff deadline is early September. Um, you would it would be better just holding all things equal to wrap this up before the House comes back into session and people start treating September as they always do, like a way to you know win a few votes in November. Derek, for the benefit of the media, who's the lead administration negotiator on the deal? Oh, right. <laughs> Uh, the lead, <laughs> the lead, the, the lead administration for you, President the, Trump. Right, right. No, pre, that, that's right. President, the cabinet official. The, the pre, the, the, right, look, I mean, we act there, to be fair to the administration in in one respect. On investment, firma, et cetera, which is Secretary Mnuchin's province, he won. On trade, which is Ambassador Lighthizer's province, he won. So we do have some structure, but when you're talking about a comprehensive negotiation, there are more issues, all these points, not just a trade deficit. I have no idea who the master administration's lead official is. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy, that was an unfair question. And you, you say you're from Taishin? Trying to help out wow. the media. You know. <laughs> Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. I don't think there's any bigger expert on trade policy than Claire Reed. So when I saw she was here, I came over immediately to hear what she has to say because I think she answered it. I have never heard so much junk as I'm hearing now about China. Oh, this is a trade policy problem. Except from Claire. We solve except, trade. Except for what Claire no, said. Claire, agree I'm with what Claire with. said, I right? mean, we're talking about you guys personally. I was talking about generically. <laughs> oh, darn. Trade negotiations <laughs> have been a secret the U.S. has been very successful with. We have all these people who have never engaged in trade negotiations, Claire, and are telling me what's going on. Let me put it to you very simply and straight. This is the most clever administration in trade. We were all involved, I think Claire was a little bit younger then, but we were all involved in opening the Japanese market. And we opened it. We had the same problem, semiconductor. We came up with a substantially equivalent competitive opportunity. I'll make a sh I'm going to make it's it like, short. Like I've been here. Hey, I've been in this for 52 years, and you invite people who don't know the first thing about I trade policy. I'll make it a question now, but let me ask you a question. Give I'll make question. my. I may just walk out, but I'll try to That's get okay. a question. For, That's why we too keep up with your non-trade people discussing trade issues. Be my guest, but let me make the question this way: Why don't we realize this is a trade problem? That you resolve that through using pressure. This administration is, de is demobilizing the WTO intentionally because they want to go back to unilateralism, the right to do something. They will get Europe together. Why can't we have trade negotiators deal with the same way we dealt with the problem in Japan? Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Claire. Congratulations, Claire. You're the only one that's on the panel who knows this, so go ahead. No trade. I go, no Claire, trade. go ahead. Okay, uh, the, the, I think Mike made the point that the issue with China here is more for the Trump administration, I think, a strategic issue. They put out document that the, the DOD, the, the, or the, you know, the, the strategic, um, I can't remember. The national security, the national strategy. security <laughs> strategy, thank you, which uh, folks often say they, they don't pay attention to. But I think it's important to look at the language in there about the notion that there is a strategic competition, not just militarily, but also in economic terms. So I don't think that this is being viewed as simply a trade issue. And I think that uh, explains um, the approach that's being taken. I think you have to say that the Trump administration has definitely gotten China's attention in a way that uh, has not occurred um, in the recent past. And so I think whatever optimism there may have been about China's path post-WTO accession and the possibility of things moving towards liberal market economy principles, really, I think, uh, were, were falling away for many observers well before this election. But the question that's before us now, I think, is this question of what are our goals uh, more broadly and strategically and not simply in trade. I think there was a question right here, this gentleman. And then
Hi, Brian Bradley from American Shipper. Thanks for taking my question. Um, we've heard a lot from the trade associations since these tariffs have been opposed about their opposition to the tariffs and how they'll harm the economy. But what sort of practical tips would you have for trade associations and the private sector um, as they uh, continue to communicate about this issue, um, as they seek to uh, uh, solve the underlying issue of intellectual property transfers and the unfair business practices in China. So basically, you know, what tips would you have um, for them making that, making sure that is on the same level of importance as the tariffs? Jeremy, you want to do that one? Well, uh, look, it's, in terms of companies dealing with their IP challenges, or their, first of all, there are different types of IP challenges, but there are a lot of resources available. They need to be engaging with their associations. They need to be engaging with the U.S. government. Um, uh, and they need to also be, um, you know, look, some companies decide to go public with their issues. You know, there was a, um, or, or whether they decide or not, the issues get aired publicly. There was a piece recently in the New York Times on one particular company, a very lengthy, detailed piece. I thought the question was a little bit more about if a lot of associations don't like tariffs, uh, what's the best way to, is, is there, is, is that just spitting in the wind right now to articulate why that would be a bad idea? Well, I, I think that I, I understood your question as how do you ensure that IP issues are on the same priority level? Prominence, right? Well, look, I think I, look, IP issues have have been uh, have been prioritized by the by business community by the business community for years and years, and I think there's no wavering or no backing off. Many associations came out and endorsed the three the Section 301 investigation precisely because of the very serious concerns that that you know widely shared concerns about IP policies in China. Um, the chamber has an IP center. Um, you know, many associations are active on the IP issue, so I don't. I, I'm, I'm not sure that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't. I'm not sure that there's any backing off uh, uh, regarding the the IP concerns, which again are many w when it comes to China. I think we're in a, a particular situation right now where um, we may be on on the verge of going to 250 billion dollars of tariffs with real real economy impacts, with real impacts for many American companies. Um, for American farmers, for job creators, and obviously that 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 that's an, a, a very urgent concern um, uh, for the companies themselves, but also for the broader the health of the broader economy. Uh, Matt Miller, I'm with Capital Group. We run the American Funds family of mutual funds based in LA. I had a little clarifying question for Derek on what he said, and then I wanted to ask a quick broader question to the group. When you say there'll be a deal you're projecting, but it'll hold for kind of 18 months, is that because you think Trump will? Uh, want to revisit it going into the 2020 election and say they haven't been good enough and here's the next phase? Yeah, and he'll have good reason because the Chinese won't actually keep to the terms of the deal, so that'll work out fine. So something now, but then bring it back. <laughs> yes. I guess my question, th th my, my question for the group, I'd just be Sorry. curious kind of quickly, uh, each person's <laughs> assessment, it builds on something Claire said, which is what do you think the probability is now that we have, whatever you think of Trump, the first president who's called the question on Chinese behavior in this at the same time that we're more aware of Xi's uh, very grand aspirations and the geopolitical rivalry, that we're now at the dawn of an era where supply chains may become less integrated globally uh, and over the next five to ten years um, we're going to see a kind of realignment uh, uh, in ways that ha haven't really been thought about before just roughly what do you think the probability is is shocking and different from the what the norm has been for the last 20 years what do you think the odds of that are and why uh, I can give a really quick answer which is this is where the pro the Trump administration's you know attacks on the Europeans and the Canadians and the section 232 auto tariffs come into play I would be quite happy pulling supply chains out of China and we'd still have we could still have an integrated global economy with less Chinese participation but if we're going to target everybody we it's it's not really feasible we're looking at a, at a very different deglobalized economy if everyone is in the firing line just the Chinese are first and then we turn to everyone else Well, I, we're, we're not doing a good job of it right now. I, 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 could, give you, I could give you a 113 page answer. We issued a report, the Chamber did in, in 2016, the preventing, the oh, preventing deglobalization and economic and security argument for free trade and investment in, in ICT. Um, it's on our website, um, but, but we flagged this issue in ICT in, 
in information communication technology in particular in 2016. Um, obviously, the concerns are now broader as we see the potential for the erection of a tariff wall um, affecting many sectors beyond ICT. Um, uh, and I commend the report to you, but it's a it's a it's a very serious concern Matt, and risk. Wait, hold on, I want to. I want to ask everybody a yes or no answer. <laughs> Is it a mistake to be fighting a two front trade war right now? Yes, of course it's a mistake. Uh, you right. There. Two front? I think it's well, eight front. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's an eight front. I think it's an eight, eight front. That's not a yes or no answer. She cheated. China and the rest of the world. The rest of the world is the second front. Uh, Claire, yes, no. Depends. All right. Jeremy? Wow, that was. Uh, yes, I, no. I, I, y y yes, it's a mistake. Thank you, <laughs> Mike. I think it's a big mistake, a huge big, mistake, because it takes away our allies. Uh, I like. think President Trump is already seeking allies, both in Europe and among the Democrats in the Congress. I was astonished and delighted when, within hours of President Trump's first announcement on tariffs, uh, Senate Democrat leader Chuck Schumer agreed with him. Within hours, there's quite a group of. Uh, Democrats in the House and Senate both. Brad Sherman are, thinks he's a wimp. Who are agreeing with? <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, or tougher, I, tougher. Yeah, I agree with you. We're tougher than President Trump on all this. I was. Just there are also Berlin concerns Brussels. in Germany. Tell me yeah, what Berlin happened in Brussels Berlin. a week ago. You heard about this, right? And, well, I didn't hear about about. Uh, I didn't get a lot, a, a great sense of warmth for <laughs> the administration's approach on trade. Um, and you in heard fact, about Chinese intellectual property theft. The now, again, a as, as, concern. The analysis is the same. But as we saw with with uh, with Angela Merkel and Li Keqiang meeting earlier this week, um, the focus was on expressing opposition to U.S. policies, not on uh, Chancellor Merkel expressing frustration with Chinese policies. So I, I, I think um, that tells you a fair amount. I mean, that that was covered in the Wall Street Journal. I see Bob Davis over there. So. Uh, Bob Davis is here. Oh my God! Where's Bob Davis? <laughs> All right, let's go to Bob. Let's go to Bob. <laughs> I didn't see you, Bob. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Hawk on logistics. <laughs> Make sure his microphone works. Yes. <laughs> Just shout, Bob. <laughs> Uh, so let me clarify. There are talks on logistics. I don't know that they're necessarily people meeting face to face. I was only informed of a conversation of two conversations. So, but the the second part, um, <coughs> there, there's there's some cynicism injected in my opinion. In other words, I'll believe the very concrete parts that come out of a deal. That I don't mean that the deal will will not will not include other parts. I just simply don't believe they'll ever be implemented. So I'm not saying the deal itself won't look like it's more comprehensive. I just am only going to believe what's what's written in stone. Not that China will gradually improve its IP practices over the next three years, which I've heard for 25 years and counting. Any other thoughts on that, Mike? Just for Bob's question, I, I do think that the is the Chinese face a dilemma whether to fire Liu He and replace him or not. Um, explain who that is for people. Liu He is the has become the chief interlocutor, if you want to call this. You mean fire him in this job, not from being a vice premier, right? Yes, that's yes. what I mean. Uh, find mm -hmm. someone else to go meet with the Americans, and to work out a consensus better at home in Beijing, uh, who can get a deal with the Americans. Uh, Liu He has many fine qualities. I already mentioned his role as what well, I consider him a reformer, in the in the China 2030 uh, World Bank report. Um, but Liu He is not known, and he would be happy to agree with me, he's not known as a strong man who's going to force the system to come up with concessions that he can take to the White House and make a deal. There is another candidate who's been rumored who would take to take his place. He's the head of the uh, party in uh, Guangzhou. Uh, he has more of a reputation as a kind of a tough guy who would work out a deal 
first in China and then offer it and sell it uh, to the Americans. So that's what I think is uh, still waiting to be found. It would obviously not be a good idea to start the talks with someone who is a lame duck and maybe on his way out, if that's the case with Liu He. And I, I sourced all this to meetings in Beijing uh, two weeks ago. Hey, Mike, one question. When you say work out a deal within China, who, who are the major players that you see have to be at that table? Uh, NDRC, State Council, SASAC, um, how do you see that? MIT? This is, this is a topic I try to explain in the 100-year marathon in the book. Who makes decisions in China? What kind of policy debates they have? I already said once we should not say the Chinese think. We should be aware of individuals in the policy process and their differences. Um, I don't agree with Derek that all the reformers are dead. I hope, I hope you're wrong. I do agree with you, Derek, that they lost the battle when President Xi came to power. Um, but part of what could happen with multilateral approach, bipartisan approach here in Washington, is we could restore some life, as it were, to the reformers. Uh, in a way, it's Liu He is the. It's terrible. It's tragic. He stops playing this role, and we get a hard-line Stalinist economist instead, but who can put together the deal with a consensus in Beijing first. That's going, and obviously they're not going to consult the Americans on who they should send as their negotiator. All right, so I think one more question, and then we'll wrap up right here, sir. Hi, uh, my, my name is Masaki Arai from NHK TV Japan. Uh, uh, um, uh, this is my uh, question to Mr. Pillsbury. Uh, I really uh, it was interested in, in your comment about the uh, uh, you know, Mr. Trump started uh, you know, the China team uh, in the in the Trump Tower and you know, all, all that. And so my question is that uh, so what is the Trump administration's goal? Uh, what what's the uh, what kind of a relationship uh, strategic relationship does the Trump administration want to uh, make with China? I mean, economically and geopolitically. Well, the Trump administration has got two quick answers to your question. One is called the Indo-Pacific strategy of a free and open, or open and free Indo-Pacific. The president said this in Da Nang and explained what he meant by it, that nobody in that region, which could include China, he included China as a possible member of the Indo-Pacific strategy, but no one should feel coerced or dominated or a satellite. He's used different words to describe this. Um, so an open and free Indo-Pacific is one strategy. The other phrase President Trump has used about China um, is a term competitive. Not enemy, not adversary. He continues to give lavish praise to President Xi Jinping. Um, I mentioned all the phone calls, the meetings between the two of them. So he clearly is not an enemy of China. He's not going over to some kind of ultra hawk uh, position. But I think much of what he's drawn on is the Obama administration in its last year or two. There's the early Obama administration, China strategy, and then it was in the last year or two, they got much tougher. So I see continuity inside our government at the working level, what some call the deep state. I think they're the ones in, in DOD and USTR and commerce. Some of these concerns have bubbled up. The intelligence community apparently has made more stuff available, and you can see it in these reports. Um, so I see more continuity in American strategy toward China, and I think that's how the Chinese see it. They don't see Trump as somehow changing everything when he came in. So I want to uh, wrap up, but I'll just give everybody one last chance to anything, last comments you'd like to make, uh, 30 to 60 seconds. Derek? I'll do it in much less than that. I don't think we've seen the full effect of the strategic community uh, on the trade discussion, meaning that Secretary Mattis is probably going to be leaving after the midterms. We have a new national security advisor, my former colleague. We have a new secretary of state. We have personnel. We portrayed this as the president at the top and then Lighthizer and Mnuchin fighting below him. Um, there are new people who are going to weigh in who are in very influential positions. I think the U.S. position on China, as Claire was mentioning, the broader position is still evolving and that is going to affect our trade policy. Thank you. Claire? I agree with that, by the way. I agree with that completely. Yeah. I have predicted turbulence and unpredictability, and I'll stick with those two adjectives. That's a pretty safe bet. <laughs> Jeremy. 
I'll, I'll, I'll conclude where I started. We have serious, legitimate issues with China, um, but these tariffs are not the right approach. And um, there needs to be a more strategic, thoughtful, and effective approach that brings the allies together in dealing with China and dealing with the legitimate concerns we have with China. Um, and unfortunately, we're moving in the wrong direction right now. I have one more thought, and that is we've not talked at all about it today, but you and I, Rob, have talked about this, and that is that for the United States to look at the world as it is, including China, it needs to look at home. It needs to look at what we do to be more competitive and effective. And there are lots of dimensions to that problem and to that challenge, and we need to not neglect that because that may be one of our most potent weapons, but I don't feel like we're focused on that right now. I agree with that as well. Everybody agree with that point? Yeah. Now, book. although we then, if we told us how to do it, we'd all start disagreeing. I know. Yes. Our text gets more important. Than to right. <laughs> Get rid of government, more government. <laughs> Could I just praise the ITIF's work? Uh, you can no, no. I meant, I meant to hold this. I meant to hold this up. Uh, a ten-point user guide to the Trump tariff wars by Rob Atkinson, Stephen Azell. This is excellent. Uh, it's possible that you can have the tariffs have an effect, but it doesn't mean that other tools uh, shouldn't be applied. And that's why I bring up, I thought somebody would answer the question over here on uh, what trade associations can do. You know, the administration has said the products selected for these tariffs are companies or products that have benefited from intellectual property <coughs> theft or serious subsidies. So the choice of which products put the tariffs on is not protectionism, that we want to preserve some particular industry or company. It's to punish the Chinese for these very policies that they now want to increase for the 2025 program. Obviously, input from companies and trade associations is important in terms of selecting those products. The only thing I, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I look, look, rat, rat poison. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I see, in other words, I see the tariffs yeah, as friends. negotiating leverage. Yeah, the tariffs are negotiating leverage uh, not uh, in and of themselves. To, to, to actually, to, to, to really close, I want to ask another question. Does everybody, <laughs> does everybody agree with this? There's, there's an important question here, which is, is this, because a lot of the press have called this protectionism, and one could argue it's not protectionism, it's offensivism. It's, it's using a tool against something. Does everybody agree that if China made a reasonable deal, that Trump would eliminate all these new tariffs? Yes, if you got, we were fairly close in May, and yes, we would, the, 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 they would drop the tariffs. They were, there was a specific objection, two specific objections in May, and I don't see any reason why, if those objections weren't addressed, the Chinese were willing to do that, we wouldn't have made it, that deal wouldn't have held. Everybody generally agree with that? Cause yes. Or my view as well. The, the tariffs are for negotiating leverage. They're not a permanent I wouldn't claim protection. That. You think they could go on? No, I, I just honestly don't know. Right, okay. and, and, um, and I you know, <laughs> go back to my my snide, but uh, you know, unfortunately, accurate point. I don't think the deal will hold into 2020. That's a different story. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> this is uh, we could go on for longer than this. Obviously, a lot of important information here to really unpack. But um, one thing we can be sure of: the next few months are going to be pretty interesting. We'll see where this ah, all goes. So please join me in thanking a great panel, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>